My name's Chris Miller. My name is Paul Anderson. My name's Mark Boyd. Hello, my name is Derek Combs, and I listen to the Blue Army Podcast. My name is Maddie Robson, and you're listening to the Blue Army Podcast. The things, but like, I, as as we've already just sort of like been preambling before the preamble, there um, yeah, there hasn't been loads of Carlisle United news. So like before we started recording, I asked you to see if you'd seen like because I'm not on Twitter or anything, but to see if you've seen any extra rumours or anything like that because, I mean, there isn't that much uh, big, big news to cover. I mean, obviously, there's a signing that's came in. I obviously have the loan reports and the injury updates. But other than that, there's not crazy amounts of news. So I've kind of like had to scour a little bit, scramble a little bit for bits of news. So, I mean, we'll be fine. We'll get through it. But uh, we might struggle to get an hour out of this one, maybe. We don't know. We, don't, we yeah. might struggle to get an hour out of this one. Um, and there might be somebody that ends up in the waiting room part way through but we'll see we'll see but just so the listeners know Will's still on holiday so um, don't, worry, don't, don't, don't worry about Will 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 be back me and Will haven't had a falling out or Liam and Will haven't had a falling out and, and pick sides or anything he's just on holiday he's having a good time he's in Austria he's, you know, he's having a good time he's having a good time um, no right. voice notes this week no no voice because he's actually Aww. in He's actually in, you know, I felt too cheeky this week. He's actually on holiday. He's not in, he's not in like a, a hotel in Manchester yeah. this week. <laughs> um, he's actually on holiday in a foreign country. So I didn't really want to disturb him with anything. <laughs> I'm sure if he wanted to be a part of it, he could have sent me a voice note if he wanted to. But he's probably having such a good time on holiday. No, no voice notes this week. I think that was all right last week, no other voice note. <laughs> yeah, I thought it was good. It was, it was the best part. <laughs> Do you know what I'll do? I'll message him in the preamble now and see if he wants to give us a man of the match. Should I just message him now quickly? Yeah, give him a quick message. Yeah, I'll give him a quick message. Uh, man of match for Saturday. Uh, question mark. Do us a voice note. It'll be a few hours even in front of behind Money as well, so... Yeah, yeah, you will. I will see. We'll see if he gets it. We'll see if he gets it, and if he, if he responds in time, there'll be about half an hour between now and by the time we get to the match report. So he's got a little bit of a window to to record. Um, I hope he doesn't send me a message in reply, and that I have to reply to the message before he sends me a voice note. Because as you can see, I'm terrible at texting and talking at the same time. <laughs> <laughs> right. Anyway, anyway, let's get on with the show, mate. Let me introduce. Let me introduce. Oh, it matters. How's it going? And welcome back to the Blue Army podcast. This is, of course, episode 81, and I am joined by one half of the Cumbian Brain Trust. That's right. It's Liam Denwood from Blue Army TV. Welcome back, mate. How are you? Uh, yep, yeah, fine. Uh, just wish I was feeling better about Carlisle at the minute. That's the only uh, the only downside at the moment. I mean, like it was, we were going to get beat at some point, weren't we? Like in the league, we were going to get beat at some point. And I think the injury crisis and things like that have given us a little bit of a uh, bit of leeway. We don't feel too bad. There's not too much like dour atmosphere about the result and where we kind of are in the league table right now. I think. Most Carlisle fans are more optimistic this season compared to what we were last season. And, uh, I mean, it won't take much to turn it around, mate. It won't. It won't. We're going to make all these Carlisle fans and you feel better, mate. And do you know how we're going to do that? I mean, you know exactly how we're going to do that, (laughs) don't you? What a segue! (laughs) Here we go. That means it's time for one thing. And one thing only at this time of the show. It's time for the Blue Army Podcast Show of the Week. Get in! Is he having a laugh? I think he's trying to. It's the Blue Army Podcast. podcast. Yo, Yo, of the week. Right, okay. I almost screwed up my own intro then. Here we go. Here we go. You think I'll be rehearsed by now? 81 jokes. 81 (laughs) jokes. This might be the best one so far. And if you guess it, I won't be upset. I won't be upset if you guess it. But I will be upset. You know what I mean? It's one of them. Here we go. (laughs) You've built it up too much now. It's going to be shocking. Here we go, man. Here we go. Why did the golfer have to change his pants? I don't know. Why did the golfer have to change his pants? Well, because he got a hole in one. 
That's all you're getting. You're getting, you're getting a little chuckle. <laughs> that was pretty good. That was pretty good because, you know, hole in one, hole in... Yeah, there we, I thought that was pretty good, but I'm quite happy with this week's joke of the week. That was, that was one of my, it's one of my favourites in a while. It's been one of my favourites in a while. Right, on to pressing matters. Uh, you might have heard last week on the show that I tried to start a little bit of... Uh, I mean, not a real fight. It was, a, it was supposed to be a charity thing with, uh, with uh, the other... Podcast. Now, as far as I know, nothing has been responded to, um, apart from they had a cheeky little swipe on uh, on Twitter, which I found funny, and I reposted that and tagged yeah, it, it on Instagram. Funny. And that wasn't, that wasn't unfortunately, bait enough for, to get them to start a back and forth and an interaction with me. Uh, maybe they just don't check their Instagram that often, I don't know. And I, like I said, I'm not on Twitter, so, I mean, maybe, maybe there are cogs in motion, but nothing's got to me yet. And Liam, you've not heard anything either of you no i haven't said anything i think i think if you could sort of uh bridge the differences i think it would be a very good sort of guest episode on the blue army podcast to like I'd sort of to do that. unite unite the two podcasts sort of thing you know have you and <laughs> you on theirs and them on yours like sort of thing like a back and forward collaboration sort of thing so yeah. I'd be happy. I'd be happy to do that. I offered that. That's where it all kind of started, I guess. I kind of got, uh, I mean, not ignored. I mean, I, I've got to go over this story so many times, but I did reach out to them uh, <laughs> when I realized they existed. I think I was on about episode sort of seven or eight by that point. And uh, just to sort of like see if there was uh, any any feelings that maybe felt trampled on, maybe felt like I was I was trying to segue in there a little bit. And uh, I mean, I didn't get a response. So they, they probably did feel a bit sort of like, uh, screw this kid. Uh, but I've, I've been around a while now, <laughs> and uh, so have they. And I'd rather us, you know, work together. I really would. I mean, I'm sure they've got a fine product. And, uh, I mean, I enjoy doing this. Maybe that's what it is. Maybe they just don't enjoy this. Maybe this is just too silly for them. Because they're all, you know, they, they get the facts right over there, and we're just we're just playing, aren't we? <laughs> <laughs> it's a lot more serious, yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. And if you're into that kind of thing, that's absolutely fine. Like I say... It, it was more of like a publicity stunt. I imagine, you know, their listenership gone up a little bit and my listenership will probably go up a little bit for this show as well, off the back of that. There was a lot more response on my social media than there normally is when I'm posting things. And um, so I felt a bit of a swell. And for that love and appreciation, thank you very much. Um, we'll move on. We'll move on. If there's any more news to do with the other podcast and me, obviously you guys will be the first ones to know. Um, but yeah, we're, we're going to move on. We're going to move on. It was it was fun for the week that it lasted, <laughs> <laughs> but it might be over, right? The proper news, mate. The proper news this week, and like we already kind of said in the preamble, there's not loads of it, unfortunately. Uh, it's been a bit of a slow week for Carlisle United. There has been things that have happened, but not many things you can have a great opinion on. Obviously, the first bit of news that I've got is that uh, Carlisle versus Grimsby was abandoned. If you don't know that by now, it was around the 24th minute. I'm sorry, I just dropped my pen on the floor. Um, it was around the 24th minute and uh, the game was abandoned like midway through the first half. What a log pitch. I mean, they should have guessed it before the game kicked off. It's a little bit frustrating. That game's going to get replayed on September the 27th. So if you've got tickets, those are still valid. And uh, I believe if you want a refund, you can go and get a refund if you can't turn up. There's no issues there. So go down to Brunton Park, get your money back, or uh, or go along to the game on the 27th of September. That'll be a quarter to eight kickoff on the 27th of September. I mean, Liam, did you watch any of that on iFollow? Did you see any of the sort of like pre match That pitch looked awful, man. Like you can yeah, see the, the it pitch, from where yeah. we yeah i watched it on i follow jesus christ i don't it was one of them ones where i understood why they started it because it 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 got very bad after they started the game like it wasn't it was probably a flip of the coin whether they started it in the first place but then it got progressively worse the rain got worse and they had to call it off like there was a tackle on jack armor that i've seen the clip replayed quite a few times online where the tackle goes in it might have been finn but finn back and he was and there's just a big wave of water as he, as he goes to the floor. And you just think, and there was passes that would go about two feet in front of them and just stop in the water. And it was, it was one of them. It was just, I was sitting there watching it and thinking, right, I'm I'm not even going to bother like cheering us on or anything here from home because it's going to get called off. It doesn't matter what's going to happen because it's going to get called off in 10 minutes anyways. It was just more funny to watch because it was poor from, um, from the grounds people. And they did this thing where, I'm not sure how good it is. And I'm not a groundsman by any, any 
stretch of the imagination, but they brought brooms on, which I understood to try and get some of the water off. But they brought these rollers onto the pitch, and I thought, well, that's just going to compress it into the ground, surely, isn't it? Because they were <laughs> they had these rollers on that, like, you're not pushing the water off the pitch with them. You're just going over it's it and sick. sort of like compressing yeah. it into the ground. I thought, what are you, what are you doing? <laughs> what are you doing? Well, that's not going to work. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, no, exactly. Man. They're not going to work. But it, yeah, it was the right decision to get it called off. Yeah, I mean, um, a lot of things have been said about the fact that we're going through a little bit of an injury crisis at the moment. And obviously getting the fixture replayed in a month's time is hopefully going to mean we're going to have a lot more of our first team regulars available for that. So in the long run, do you think this is going to benefit Carlisle United? Yeah, yeah. Well, it will, well, I say that. If we go and then lose the game, even with our full squad back, then it means absolutely nothing. But it does give us a better chance going into the game than we almost would have, because I think... Owen Moxon's due to come back pretty soon. Morgan Feeney as well, who who are two of our standout performers from the early part of this season. Them two are both going to probably be back for that game, and, and you know that that that's more than a big boost for us. You know that's that's an absolutely massive advantage to give us compared to when we were meant to be playing it. Yeah, yeah, that, 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 those were my kind of sentiments around it as well. I feel like we, we've actually got a little bit of luck there, and we should have a better squad when we when we get to that fixture in. On September yeah. the twenty seventh, it's worth noting as well with that one, the owners of um, of Carl have offered to sort of pay the travel for um, all the fans that travelled down there. They're going to pay for the travel for them to go back down when in the rearranged fixture, which I thought was quite a nice touch from the board. You know, I've been very critical of the board, but I thought I thought it was a very nice nice touch from them there. No, that's really good, man. And thanks for mentioning that. So in case anyone that's listening here is going to that game, then now you know your transport. If you didn't already know, your transport's also going to be covered. Um, in other news, mate, I mean, the biggest news story that we really have to talk about is the uh, signing of Duncan Idahan, a 20-year-old centre-back slash sort of like left-sided centre-back slash I've played 30 minutes at left-back in the championship. Um, season, is it a season-long loan? Is it a half-season loan? Half-season. Half-season. Half, yeah. A half-season loan. I mean, by this point, are we getting a bit silly with loans? Do you think we've got one too many in at the club kind of thing? Are we getting are we getting to the point of uh, uh, too many loans? Uh, I'm not sure. I, I, I'll tell you what. I wouldn't put money on the fact that we'll ever see this guy play. Like, as, as good as some of the Bristol City fans seem to think he is, I feel like he's just another one to pad the bench out a bit because you, you've got to think, although we did have a bit of a defensive crisis with injured centre-backs, I think we've got about seven centre backs in the club now, and you know you just think, yes, you play with a back three, but even then, even when you play your second choice back three, there's still somebody left out of the team, and you know with Jack Ellis going along quite well, I thought this was pretty. It was just a. I don't know why they did the sign and sort of thing, like, because it, whether it turns out to be a good sign or not, and however skilled this guy is, is there any really need for him? Because I think he probably could have gone somewhere else and got game time, but I just think centre backs one of our strongest positions when everyone's fit. And we've got loads of them, so I just don't see the point in in bringing him in. See, I think what it is, is we're not strong enough in the air at the back, especially when there's injuries in that back line. Now, that has improved a lot when you look at Paul Huntington and his frame. But this kid, Duncan, is also six foot two, and he has a reputation of getting himself in the right position and getting the right kind of contact on the ball to clear it in the air. And Simo's very much trying to build... Um, an aerial focal point at every point of his team. He wants a big target man up front. That's why he's got Edmondson playing. Um, he wants uh, somebody sort of like along the back line that's going to win the aerial battle as well. The midfield maybe doesn't matter as much to him, but he has brought in Jaden Harrison, who is a six-footer as well. Um, he obviously wants to win those aerial con- contests, and I think that's going to also build into set-piece plays. So we're going to see those three lads or a combination of anyone anyone at the club that's over six-foot being involved heavily in set-piece movements going forward. And Yeah, I think Simo knows what it takes to win at this division. And uh, I mean, it can be as simple of having a defender on three and a half week, uh, three and a half grand a week, a midfielder on three and a half grand a week, and a striker on three and a half grand a week, and that normally seems to win League Two. Um, but we can't really do that, so we need to win it physically. And against teams like Swindon, and um, Simo's admitted it himself, we 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 can lack a bit when we're playing against teams that need to knock it long, and that's the style of their play because we're not that team anymore. We're not the knock it long team anymore. We want to get the ball down 
and play with it. And players like Patrick aren't aerial players. Like Dennis can header a ball, of course he can, but like he, he wants it into his feet as well. That's why he's such a cultured finisher. He's a really good finisher. Uh, yeah, John he's not the Gibson's... tallest either, is he? He's not going to no, win the no. aerial jewels. No, but he's like Michael Owen was never the tallest, but he was he had a decent header on him. If you could, you know, if the ball yeah. fell to him in the right position, he was a good finisher with his head as well. He was only five foot whatever, but you know, they can still head, they still train every day on these kind of things. So if you get the cross into them, they can still score these goals. And again, like talking about players like Jordan Gibson and Owen Moxon, these are players that need to play the ball along the ground. Uh, like th- that's how you get the best out of them. Same with uh, Patrick and, and like I've already mentioned and, and the wing backs, Finn back and that we play best with the ball on the ground now. So we need the second option for when things aren't going our way against these aerial teams to be winning those aerial battles as well. And hopefully like Simpson's admitted against Swindon, we lost the aerial battles in the first half and then he made the changes in the second half and then looked at himself and sort of thought, maybe I made the wrong decision going into the game, picking the wrong setup, and maybe I should have... Because I knew they were going to play aerially against us, but Simo thought he'd, we'd be able to maybe get our style of play on the go before they got their game plan on the go. But unfortunately, that just wasn't the way things went for us in the first half. And um, I mean, I've gone on a bit of a ramble there, and I don't know exactly what the point was, <laughs> but I feel like I've made about several points, to be completely honest. <laughs> Uh, um, but yeah, Duncan joins us on a half season, lo- uh, half season loan. He's six foot two. He might be a little bit of a redundant signing, but thing is as well, he, he can. I, I think he can cover at left back, can he? And I don't think we have that back up on the left hand side. So I, th- I wonder if maybe that's another reason to bring him in. Like I, he doesn't strike me as a wing back, but as like a defensive left back in a back four. I think he probably could do a job. I mean, potentially, potentially, Simo did say that, but he didn't say that he's going to look at him as a left back. When he was questioned on left back cover, he actually brought up the name Taylor Charters. And obviously, we'll go through that when we go through the injury news a little bit. But yeah, that seems to be he wanted more left sided players. Um, but he, I think he thinks Taylor Charters is more more than capable of being the, the number two left wing back. And uh, I'm not surprised either because he is a good left sided player. People seem to have forgot that because of the last sort of 18 months, he's been being brought off the bench and put in a more central role. But I've always thought of him as a left-sided player that got put in the middle because he was one of our best left-sided players because, you know, we had Max and um, Lewis Bell and they're left-sided strikers. They like to come off the left. So, you know, you've got to push somebody into the middle if everybody needs to get a bit of game time. Yeah, and it's worth noting at, at Gate said he played that sort of wing back role as well. So he has got experience playing out there. So like I, I feel like that's quite well covered, but only I only feel like that this week because Simos brought that up and said they off the back <laughs> of this signing, who he thinks is his left back signing. And it all makes sense to me. And and thank Christ in Simo we trust, mate. In Simo we trust. I can't imagine this loan deal costing us a lot of money. I I can't imagine us paying that much of this 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 lad's wage. Um no. and aerially, if Paul Huntington, when he gets back from injury, takes a knock or you know he's a veteran centre back so like things like that might happen he might like Johnson's paint trophy games things like that I feel like this is the natural replacement for those games and this young lad's going to be the aerial leader the one that's supposed to be first to the ball the first defender to the ball kind of thing and obviously the other two centre backs can sit in behind him and eat those scraps and kick it wide and get it into the attackers and then we score more goals hopefully Oh, dear me. In other news, my friend, Rochdale have sacked their manager. The first sacking of the season. He's gone. Poor old Mr. What was his name again? Stockdale. Rochdale. Stockdale. Stockdale. Yeah. I, don't know, I don't know why that took me. I knew it was. It just it sounded too similar in my head. <laughs> I was like, no, you're just making that up now. Rochdale and Stockdale. That just sounds ridiculous. But no, his name is Stockdale. And uh, McNulty has uh, taken over. And he's sort of a veteran centre-back player Jim McNulty uh, has taken over a sort of caretaker manager for now interim charge interim whatever that means I feel like that's a made up word um, have you seen who's a front runner for that job and that was what we were going to talk about mate. yeah the return <laughs> of potentially Chris Beach uh, in League 2 I want him to take it mate I, I, I want to see Chris Beach back at Brunton Park I reckon he'll kick the fuck off <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> yeah, I like Chris Beach. I and you know what? They, they get a good manager in him there as well. I'm surprised he hasn't gone to like. I don't know why, but he always felt like a Fleetwood manager to me. Chris mm-hmm. Beach, like I thought that's where he was going to go when they sacked their manager, but. Yeah, Rochdale, he's been there before. I don't see any reason why not. And he is a fantastic manager. I thought he was a little bit hard done by it, Carlisle. Especially, like, I feel like the players threw in, threw in the towel a bit under, under, yeah. under Chris Beach at Carlisle. And he always said that brilliant run where he got to top of the league for a bit at Christmas. Yeah, Chris Beach, Rochdale will be lucky to have him. Yeah, I agree with that, man. And obviously, we, we've seen uh, what Chris Beach can do when he can turn a team around. But he, Chris Beach feels like one of those managers where if he doesn't get to keep changing the changing room around and bringing new personalities in and getting rid of the personalities that are sick of him, then things go stale for him. And I feel like uh, with the budget that Carlisle United have, with the contracts that they sort of had in place while while Chris Beach was there, he kind of got lumbered with a couple of personalities, which he might have otherwise wanted to have moved on a little bit, maybe. And um, I feel like Chris Beach's coaching style can be quite grinding. And if you're not a hardworking player, you won't enjoy it for longer than a season or two. Because, yeah, you'll get the best out of you. But it's every bloody day and it's relentless. You know, I can imagine <laughs> him being Mr. Yeah. High Standards and Mr. Bark at you in training. So. Well, from what I heard when, he, when Chris Beach was sort of new at the club, is that... Um, his training sessions were a lot more sort of intense and, and a lot better than Stephen Presley's who came in, who was before him. Like I, I spoke to somebody who said it was, it was training with the first team at the time. And they, and they were like, Chris Beach, his training sessions are so much more difficult and, and in, in a good way though. Whereas I feel like Stephen Presley was a, a bit more of a sort of man manager sort of thing. Like he could speak to the players, whereas Chris Beach was more of a, tactician sort of thing that's what that's what he strikes me as Chris Beach and that's what I think he'll that's why I think he'll do well at, at Rushdale yeah uh, talking about ex Carlisle people doing well Chedwin Scott who signed for Notts County for a little bit of money a week ago has got on to score in his debut and he seems to be hitting the ground running once again I've said it once and I'll say it again missed opportunity we could have kept yeah. him, put him on a couple of years contract, loaned him out to Gateshead or whoever else, you know, and uh, I feel like we're, that's going to bite us in the arse one day. He's going to turn up at Brunton Park one day and, he, you know, it's going to bite us in the arse. Um, but good luck to him, man. Good luck to him. His career seems to be going really well. I'm just frustrated that we let him go. I don't think that would have happened under Simo. No, I think it was I think it was the right signing at the wrong time, Sedwin Scott. I feel like under, if, he, if we had got him now, I'd be a lot more excited about it. He just... In that sort of relegation battle, you can't afford to give sort of new, young, unproven strikers a chance. You need to go with what you know sort of can work, so like you know more experienced players. I feel like that's why he didn't get the chances at the very end of uh, the season he was released. But yeah, I I expect him to play League Two football at some point in his career, maybe in the near future. And I, I feel a bit bad for Gateshead, you know, because in that Notts County game the other day. The, the two strikers that scored were Sedwin Scott and I think Macaulay Long, Longstaff. Uh, Lang, Longstaff or Langstaff, one or two, who they yeah. both bought from Gateshead in the summer. You know, they yeah. just... <laughs> but yeah, brilliant. I, he's a good player and he, he'll be back. Don't worry about that. I'm sure he will. I'm sure he will. And, uh, well, I mean, we'll move on to the injury news, Mal, mate. Uh, long-term injuries are obviously Joel Senior, Brennan Dickinson, Josh Dixon, Ben Barkley, and uh, Toby Shaw Silver's still got about four to five weeks to go as well. But in terms of players coming back, hopefully against Gillingham, we'll get Morgan Feeney, Ryan Edmondson, and Owen Moxon all coming back from injury to join us this week. And... Things are looking up, aren't they, mate? That's just going to instantly improve the squad. Now, we've talked about Taylor Charters also coming back from injury and hopefully being quite successful at filling in at left-back, and he might have to because there hasn't been an update yet, but Jack Armour did go off towards the end uh, of of the game in around the, the 89th minute, and it's quite unusual for Jack Armour to come off uh, in any game, especially for Hilton. So... I wasn't sure if they were maybe moving things around and for the last sort of like three minutes of the game, they wanted to like, get another player up front and so they got rid of a defender and moved Idahoan out left and just played with a back four. Um, but I don't know, maybe Armour did take a bit of a knock there. Have you heard anything about that? I haven't heard anything, no. It was one of them substitutions where it was just there on the back foot. 
were on the edge of their box, go and get somebody who can attack better. But yeah, I I, I hope it's nothing serious because, like you said, Taylor Char is is a good player, but in my eyes, he's more of a midfielder, not so much a left back. So I feel like he is our only natural left back, Jack Armour. So, and plus the other injuries we've got, I hope it isn't anything too bad. Yeah. <laughs> um, in other injury news, obviously Paul Huntington made his Carlisle United debut coming off the bench, so he's on Paul Simpson's schedule. Simo said, I feel like he's in front of the schedule. I think Simo said he wouldn't get involved until the Gillingham game and then probably start him in the under-23s against Man United, but maybe Paul's feeling uh, much better better and has looked after himself better than people thought he did over the summer and is ready to go against Gillingham. Uh, would you expect him to start against Gillingham after playing about half an hour uh, last Saturday? I think it depends whether Feeney's back or not. I think uh, that's got entirely entirely will determine it. But I think Paul Huntington, I don't know if you saw it, but there was a moment where Carlisle were pushing up the pitch where he's in the middle of the back five. And he's looking around and he's barking orders at both centre-backs either side of him, which I think was John Mellish and this new lad who would just come on. And he was waving them up the pitch. And I just thought, that's experience that. And he's going to give that to these young centre-backs around him. So I hope he's fit enough to start against Gillingham because we could really do with winning that game. And I feel like if he does start, we'll have a much better chance because I really like the Paul Huntington signing. I hope he starts. And, you know, I'm, if I had to put money on it, I'd say he'll maybe make another substitute appearance and I maybe won't start, but I'd I'd really I hope he does start. Yeah, I mean I, I think if you can play half an hour, you can probably play an hour with a twenty minute break in the mid like, you know, after forty five minutes. Yeah. So I, I, I would, I would hope that he's going to start and they'll check on him at half-time and see how he's getting on. I don't think 45 minutes is going to be too much football for him. I'm not a physio or anything like that. Um, <laughs> although, I do have a little bit of inside knowledge from a physio at Bunton Park who has been working with Paul Huntington. Apparently, Paul Huntington's quite inquisitive about his uh, uh, fitness and has been asking quite a lot of questions and is a very nice man to work with. Um, he's just a curious soul. So that sounds nice for the physios <laughs> be working with it's not like why are you stretching me this way why am i stretching this way why why are we doing this exercise he's just asking a lot of questions but not in like a weird aggressive way or anything he just likes to know what the benefit is of the things that he's doing so he sounds like a really good personality he sounds like he's really happy to learn at this stage in his career and i feel like he's going to be a sponge around paul simpson because Huntington might have managerial um, aspirations in the very near future. And obviously this being his whole town club and us being at the level that we're at in a couple of years time, this could be the ideal job for him to be walking into. So for him to get to know the ins and outs of the backroom personalities and how things work at Brunton Park, I feel like he's just going to, he's going to enjoy his time here. I really do. Uh, Lawn watch, my friend, Sam Fishburne finally started a game. Uh, he started against Chorley on Tuesday night. Unfortunately, it was a one-all draw and he was substituted off. And the man he was substituted off for was the person who scored the equaliser. And on the Saturday, Sam Fishburne started on the bench. And unfortunately, they were already 2-0 up. And the man, the same man, scored a goal in that game as well. It does feel like, and I, because I've been looking into it a little bit more, Sam's having not a bad time. It's just that this guy called, what's he called, McNall, is having a great time scoring goals at the moment for uh, uh, Blythe Spartans. I mean, what can you do when, you, when your other strike partners or your competition's on fire, mate? There's nothing you can do, is there? Yeah, not much, but, you know, he was that man at Lancaster, so he, I don't know, it's a weird one for me because I, I do like him a lot, but if he can't get into the Blythe start, Spartans team, I don't see what sort of chance he's got here. Even if he is getting outscored by this other striker there, if you're professional league two quality and good enough to start for us every week, do better than him, do better than him in, in training, and, and when you get subbed on, score the goals that you need to score and it, it's, a, it's a difficult one for me but yeah there's not much you can do at the minute 
Now, it's always difficult. I mean, we always, as Carlisle United fans, want to see Carlisle United youth players come through and be really successful. But it's always by the time they get to 19, 20, 21, there's people coming through at the same time. And you kind of have to get a bit more cutthroat about them, don't you? And you're right. They just have to sink or swim. And he has to really, really dig down deep and score some goals. I mean, or at least like sacrifice his body to look like he's desperate to score some <laughs> goals or whatever it's going to take for him to get into that starting lineup. Uh, Lewis Bell made his debut for Gretna 2008 against Celtic B in the 4-1 loss. I mean, there was, there was, uh, he didn't start, he came off the bench. Again, disappointing. And then as we move on to talk about Max Gillespie at Annan, he didn't even come off the bench this weekend. But the bigger news is Peter Murphy carries on losing games. Annan are second bottom of their division and have only won one game in four. Um, I like to look over the border. I like Peter Murphy being in charge at Annan. I don't know a lot about Annan, but like, what what could this be? Like, why have, is, is, it, is it the Owen Moxon effect we were talking about last week? Is, it, is he that good that he was carrying Annan? Maybe that, and maybe the mental strain of losing the playoff semi-final, because obviously, you know, you, you you have such a good season like they did, and you don't go up. It's going to have quite a mental effect on the players, and I feel like that's maybe what's happened over there. It looks like my career mode, uh, not my career mode, it looks like my football manager save at the minute, you know, I'm trying to do an Allen one, and I'm, I'm currently like, <laughs> like, lost my first few games. I'm sitting rock bottom as well, so yeah. <laughs> it's a hard time, is it? It's a hard time at all. It's, it's a hard, very hard time, and <laughs> but they just need to get a few wins on the board at, at, at Annan. I, I'm not going to pretend like I'm a massive Scottish football enthusiast and that I know the ins and outs of the Scottish League too. But, you know, you, you're losing that many games, something must be wrong. <laughs> I downloaded the uh, one of those football manager database things. So I got the... Um the lower league. So I've got all the way down to Carlisle City's level and uh, I managed to get like a promotion with them. And the first player that I've uh, got from Carlisle United is Gabriel Breeze. And he just keeps me clean sheets, man. I, I, I draw a lot of games. <laughs> like, I don't score often. I draw a lot of games and I'm constantly hounding Carlisle United for players on loan. But in the game, for some reason, they're set as ri- Carlisle City and Carlisle United are set as rivals. So like they won't they won't send you anyone on loan, <laughs> and then like their players because they've played at Carlisle United youth level, just aren't interested in coming to yeah. So it's difficult. So I poach them from Annan <laughs> or Blythe Spartans. <laughs> like, try and poach players from there. Oh dear me, love a bit of football manager. Can't wait for the new ones to come out. Anyway, we'll move on to the match report. Carlisle United, unfortunately received their first league loss of the season, losing 2-1 at the hands of Swindon Town. And I'll give you Calais United starting lineup for the game. There was Thomas Hoyley in net, back Ellis, Whelan, Mellish and Armour across the back line with Harris, Guy and Gibson in the midfield, Dennis and Patrick playing up front. Now, we've already kind of alluded to the fact that Paul Simpson has said that this maybe wasn't the best lineup for him to start with. Maybe he should have gone a bit more physical. Is, you know, like, do you know enough about Idaho to, to, to sort of agree with it? Is he, is he just trying to take the blame and take the pressure off his players? Is he, is he you know, is that, kind, is that what he's trying to do there? Yeah, I think it is. And as well, what what is he going to change? We've got that many injuries and that many players out and you and he, he's very open about that he, he doesn't want to start Paul Huntington yet so mm-hmm. what can he do really I mean what you can't put Jack Stretton on yet because he really hasn't impressed me when he's st- when he started or when he's come off the bench even uh who are you going to put in, in the midfield battle you know you've got this new lad Jaden Harris who is meant to be a big physical midfielder so yeah he, he has gone and done that uh you know you could maybe throw Jamie Devitt in there but he's not the most physical of players you know the only real answer there is Paul Huntington coming on, which he which he did in the end. So I, I don't think there's anything more Paul Simpson could have really done. Uh, so but yeah, stretched. yeah, yeah. But it's a nice change because under the last managers, you would have heard like, "Oh, we played well. It's not the manager's fault because we don't have the squad." Whereas Paul Simpson openly tries to take the blame himself, which is a nice, which is why I think Paul Simpson's as successful as he is because he's got that sort of. He's a bit more humble than most managers, and it's a nice, it's a nice uh, thing to see him, him trying to take a little bit of pressure off the players because managers in the past definitely haven't done that. 
it was really genuine in his post match interview, the way he kind of like realized it in the moment that maybe like he, he was sort of talking about team performance. He was talking about the team lacking in the first half and not coming out the blocks, firing, being too late to sort of get into the game. But he kind of, re- he kind of like in, in a moment almost when he started talking about his substitutions contribution to the game, realized that maybe his team selection was the thing that wasn't was it was at fault for the game and then started to take the blame himself and it it just seemed really genuine in the post match uh, interview there it really did um maybe you could have changed formation i don't know like i've i've said this before um you, you might be leaving ellis a little bit exposed i'm not saying he's not done really well but you know wheeling and mellish together in the back four putting Devitt into the midfield to be that kind of a experience letting callum guy maybe sit back as a, a defensive midfield option to to help them out but you know it's it's a diamond maybe that we're looking at like a 442 diamond or from what i heard patrick omari was quite poor on the day as well but Obviously, that's in retrospect. You'd maybe want to play five in the midfield and four at the back and one up front. But that's only after, you know, seeing Patrick Omari maybe not having the best game of his career. The goals, mate, the highlights, the goals. The first Stevenage goal was was kind of what we were expecting from Stevenage. It was a long ball from the back in their own half and Mellish kind of weak in the air unfortunately against their attacker who just knocked it down into their winger what was he called um smith and he just hits it first time on a half volley and it goes in the back of the net this is what we were Took supposed a to expect. reflections yeah 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 but this is what we were supposed to expect this is the kind of play that we were expecting all game what why 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 were we so lacking in the moment then i think they got all their joy from our left back position, and I don't think this is too much of a, you know, a dig at Jack Armour, but because I feel like a lot of the time he was just left stranded by himself. I feel like it was more a matter of Mellish needed to go over and help him a little bit more because every single time they got the ball in the midfield, they would easily just pass it out wide over that our left back position, and every single time Jack Armour was left isolated, and every single time they sort of got it, and that's where both our goals come from, really. Uh, you know, that that left-back position from us. And I feel like, yeah. yes, Jack Armour, you know, you can argue he might want to do better, but most of the time there's two players over there marking him and, and there's not really much he can do. So I feel like it was more of a sort of Mellish error for the first goal. Like you said, he wasn't as strong in the air. I think even then he should be pushing a little bit further left to, to help Armour because we're very, very solid on this right-hand side. And it was funniest to see that because... Our experienced left-hand side looked weak, and the side that had Jack Ellis and um, and back were our strongest side of the defence. So I think it is more just a matter of do you take Mellish out of the team and put somebody else there to help on the left, or you know, or is it just an issue that Stevenage have decided to exploit that other teams maybe won't notice? I don't know, but I feel like a lot of our problems did come from that left back position. Yeah. I'm- like you kind of said about when Paul Huntington came off the bench in the game, he he started to lead the defence and show them a little bit more. So I think Mellish will respond really good to that. And once again, you'll get like a, a better performance out of Mellish. And maybe Mellish doesn't want to listen to Whelan because maybe Mellish feels like he's better than Whelan as a defender. So maybe there's a little bit like of a, of a, a, a poor relationship there. But whether, you know, when Morgan Feeney's in the back line, he's obviously the best defender. So there's no arguing with Morgan Feeney when he's wearing the captain's armbands from Mellish. Do you know what I mean? There's, there's not that room yeah. to argue with. But it's almost like the stepdad and the dad. You don't argue with your dad, but you'll argue with your stepdads. And that's kind of what's happened <laughs> in Carlisle's back line, maybe. And Mellish kind of just maybe isn't listening to instruction or maybe Whelan's not giving instruction because he's not that kind of a player. And, you know, uh, we're, we're going to see improvement in that back line and Paul Hunterson will help Feeney and he will help uh, Mellish. It'll be interesting to see who takes the lead in communication when Feeney and Huntington start playing together and who sits in the middle and who's, who goes left and right and stuff like that. That'll be quite interesting to see. Or maybe we go 4-4-2 because the two centre-backs that we have are that good that we can start going 4-4-2 and putting more players up front again. I don't know. I genuinely don't know. Um, Steven Edge's second goal... It is fun to talk about possibilities, though. Steven Edge's <laughs> second goal was... was um, 
down the right hand side, simple ball played out from the striker to the winger to sort of lay him off of a cross. The winger absolutely does armor. Like <laughs> it's a nice little bit of skill. I he told just you that left back spot. Yeah, yeah, you're right. He just this time he just he made armor look. I haven't seen armor look that much of a mug. Like I don't think ever in a Carlisle shirt. He, it's just one of those playground bits of skill where they just chip it over you. Like it's really yeah. annoying. Like that's but, going um, sort of thing against Scotland. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, it's one of those where he just kind of yeah he just flicks it over him and then yeah you know, Carlisle like you said Mellish is too far away like you shouldn't ha- you shouldn't really have the time that deep into the Carlisle half to flick the ball over one defender and then then bring it down and then get the cross in like somebody should have been on him a lot faster than that so yeah you're right it is that left hand side it's a decent little cross in though once he does bring it down and uh, a nice a nice easy tap in. For the, uh, I think it was the left back that scored the goal for them. Uh, name Clark. Um, frustrating one that one, mate. For me, um, that one did show more defensive frailty than the first goal. The first goal was like a classic League Two goal. You can say from a team that plays that hit the ball long, lay it off style of football. But this one was more us. This one was more error. You know what I mean? Yeah, and I think as well as the initial mistake over on the left-hand side, Back loses his man far too easy for that tap-in on the other side as well. Like, he'd come quite narrow in. I thought it was Jack Ellis at first. Looking back, it's it's Finn Back that loses his man. You know, they look very similar. But um, it, it just it's just far too easy, and it was just a lapse of concentration. It, it's one of those ones that was lack of experience, I think. I think an experienced fullback, you know, as much as I slated him last season, that doesn't happen with Kelvin Miller there at right back. Mm, you're right. Yeah, you're absolutely right. You're absolutely right. Um, Carl Harris finally responded only about three minutes after the second Stevenage goal. Patrick Omari with a clever inside ball into Gibson who laid off a, an inch-perfect cross for Dennis, who had acres of space in the six-yard box to knock it in at the back post. Now, like I've said, he's not the biggest attacker in the world in terms of being a target man, being a tall guy. But if you do get the accuracy of the cross, he can find the back of the net on a regular occasion. And that is five in five for Dennis. Um, do we start building a statue now? Like, what the hell's going on, man? He's <laughs> killing it, man. He's killing it. Yeah, he's doing well. It's he's the first player since I think the fifties to score in our opening five league in our opening five games of the season. You know, he's he's on a brilliant run of form. I wish he would start scoring more winners and less equalizers, sort of thing. Like, but you know, <laughs> but I yeah, someone else would contribute as well. <laughs> exactly, and you know what? That's the big issue. I feel like I think as much as I like Dennis scoring these goals, we had the exact same issue when Mellish was scoring loads of goals where we were far too reliant on one player. And then when he stopped scoring goals, nobody scores them. Like I remember back then I was saying, I said it at the time, Mellish is scoring all our goals from midfield. We're not getting any goals from our strikers. And I feel like we're going to have the same issue where we're getting no goals from midfield, but we're getting far too many just from Dennis. Hopefully I'm wrong and it's far too early in the season to say that. And I'm very happy that he's scoring all these goals, but I hope it doesn't become an issue. But it's something, it's something to certainly keep an eye on. It was a good way to end, the, to, to end the second half, man. Dennis is absolutely on fire. But you would have thought that might have inspired a bit of a spark from Carlisle United going into the second half. But really, we came out for the second half and similar way to the way we came out for the first half and it wasn't until the debuts a double substitution of Duncan Idahan and Paul Huntington that we started to get a little bit more of a grip of the game again starting to look a bit more comfortable again but never really threatened unfortunately um was that a really obvious substitution do you feel like Simpson be waited a little bit too long to do it I think if he was fit enough to do that I think he maybe should have started Huntington. I like to see him with the number six shirt on. It does look good on him, but he, um, yeah. <laughs> You've got a fit good for shirts and numbers. Like. I do. You know, <laughs> like I, 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 I'm, shirts and numbers. Yeah, exactly. I mean, you should see me on Football Manager. Everyone's on one till 11, my starting 11. <laughs> and then uh, <laughs> again after that. But yeah, yeah, shirt numbers, brilliant. But yeah, it was a good substitution to make. I thought he maybe should have put Devon on because I think one other thing we were missing was that sort of link between attack and midfield. Like Gibson was good in parts, but I feel like it was playing a little bit too deep to have that really like that attack and midfielder sort of effect. 
that like a Devitt or I suppose he put Hilton on. Hilton was his choice, but he came on far too late. I feel like in the second half he should have made that that substitution where he put Huntington and the new lad on, and then put either Devitt or Hilton on for maybe Jaden Harris who looked a little bit out of out of his sorts in the second half. Yeah, I mean, he did. I feel like Jaden Harrison is, I don't know why I say Harrison. It feels like I'm not completing the name. It's Jaden <laughs> Harris. I feel like Jaden Harris has got the, I don't know, nerves maybe. Like he's so far away from home. Maybe he's not settled in yet. Maybe it's just, there's something nervy about his play. He doesn't look comfortable yet on the ball. I haven't seen him look comfortable yet on the ball. You know, he just seems a bit jittery still. And hopefully he'll calm down and that's going to turn into a really good signing. But it's something that I've been a bit worried about. Is he, he seems to be really keen to get rid of the ball when he has the ball. And when he was brought into the club, he was supposed to be a, a box-to-box midfielder, which is somebody that can take the ball from one box to the other box kind of vibe, or at yeah. least be a go-between. And um, so hopefully he'll brush off those nerves and everything will be fine soon. But we, we, we finally got to play the kind of football we wanted to play when we started winning the aerial battles. And that wasn't until we made these substitutions later on in the game. Unfortunately, that was the first loss of the season. And it makes it a little bit difficult to give out a man of the match award. But we're going to try. Uh, I'll just check my phone quickly, see if Will's got back. Or the, ooh, ooh, maybe. I'll have to read it for you. Uh, um... Yeah, I'll have to read it for you. He's basically written me a message for some reason, but he hasn't like gone into loads of detail. He's kind of asked me more questions about stuff and asked it as if we're recording on Monday, but we're not. We're obviously we're recording today. But Will has gone for, uh, but the only thing I know about the performance is that Dennis scored again. In my mind, scoring his fifth goal in consecutive games is good enough to warrant some recognition, but I can't really claim it's based on anything else. So he's gone for Dennis, basically. Yeah. <laughs> he's gone for Dennis, basically. It would have been nice to have got a little bit of a voice note, uh, but obviously, Will Will Will's quite methodical and he likes to know his details. And uh, he's not gonna, he's not going to sound the fool <laughs> for another week on a voice note, you know, unless he knows exactly what he's going to be saying and exactly what he's going to be doing. So at least there's, there's there's been some interaction from Will's there. But Liam, you're actually here. Tell us who your man of the match is. You know, that's actually so difficult. I haven't a clue. Um, it is. I think... Oh, that's... I'm going to have to go the same as Wills for the exact same reason. Dennis scored, giving him the man of the match. There wasn't that much. Debating giving it to Gibson because it was a good cross that he put in for Dennis. But, nah, Dennis, I feel like he scored five goals and I haven't given him man of the match for any of them yet. So I'll, <laughs> I'll give him the credit he deserves. Give it to Dennis. Yeah. Dennis to Dennis. See, the thing is now, I'm in a bit of a predict. I couldn't think because it's harder when Carlisle lose a game who to give a man of the match award to. And for me, it came down to Dennis, obviously, because he scored the goal and Ho- Holy because I felt like he kept Good us show. in the game. There was a lot There was a lot of shots at his goal. So like, I was kind of caught between the two. I uh, did vote for Dennis last week. So... I mean, it's it's, t- it's really tedious. Like, I don't know, you know, there's not a big reason for me to pick between the two of them. If I do pick Dennis, though, he will take a very early lead in the Man of the Match Awards. But now nah, let's keep things nice and tight. Let's keep things nice and tight. I'm going to go with Hoyley and you two, Dennis for two. Uh, yeah, I'm going to go for Hoyley because, like I said, he kept us in the game. If we were going to equalise, it would have been centralised around the fact that, like, Hoyley really kept us in the game. If I go on the stats, I'll see how many shots Swindon took. And they're saying Swindon had 19. 19 Stevenage. shots. Yeah, Stevenage, Swindon. What, how many times have I said <laughs> Swindon? A lot. I bet I've said a lot. I bet I've said it a lot. Um, Stevenage, in the, in, the, uh, in the match stats, they had 19 shots on goal. So five on target, apparently. So obviously, he had a lot to do. He had a lot to do. And yeah, I'm going to leave yeah. it with Hoyley. Next he has week... impressed me, Hoyley. Yeah. Like, I was really not sure when he first came into the club. He was one of the ones where him and Moxon, I was really confused at both signings. And I was saying, maybe don't put too much pressure on these two because I didn't really like either of the signings. But they've been two of our most influential signings this, summer, uh, this season so far. Just, just goes to show, trust in Simo. You know, <laughs> he knows what he's That's doing. It. Apparently so. Like apparently so. Yeah, apparently so. And uh, I think he knows what he's do- going to be doing against Gillingham May as we go into the predictions for this weekend coming. Uh, obviously, on Saturday we play against Gillingham at Brunton Park. 
And uh, I'm, I'm predicting with a, a lot of people coming back from injury, I think Ryan Edmondson really, really will hit the ground running because he got that goal. He got a taste for it. If you thought he was keen to score goals before he scored that goal, he'll be even more keen to come back on scoring form. Trust me, because it's all about stats and goals per game for these strikers. And he'll want to get on that run and score some goals. And I reckon Carlisle are going to run out. And also because Gillingham aren't doing very well. They lost 2-0 to Harrogate, uh, 0-0 with Walsall. I reckon Carlisle are going to win 2-0 here. If Harrogate can do it, we can beat them 2-0 as well. What about you? <laughs> yeah, I, I quite rate Gillingham, to be honest with you. I had them to be top of the league in my pre-season predictions, if you remember. But I'm always going to back Carlisle, and I just think Simo's too much a genius to really... I, I just don't think... I don't want to say it, but I don't think we'll lose two games in a row sort of thing. I feel like we he will expect some sort of a bounce back, and so do I. I'll go 2-1. I'm not quite as I'm not quite as confident as you are, but yeah, 2-1 I'll go with. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, I feel like we're going to win. I do feel like we're going to win. I feel more confident we're going to win this week than I did last week when I predicted the uh, the Grimsby and the Stevenage result. Oh, now I'm thinking back. I've said Swindon so many times in this fucking episode. <laughs> <laughs> like, I've definitely said it like more than I've said Stevenage, I've said Swindon. But Swindon was last week, wasn't it? So I guess like the week before yeah, that, I've got a hangover. I've got a Swindon hangover. <laughs> <laughs> Oh dear me! Um, right, we'll uh, we'll we'll we'll, uh, we'll move on to the the last part of the show, mate, and that's on this day. And I'll be honest with you, I haven't really prepared one, so I've literally just picked up the book now, and I'm just gonna read one that takes my fancy. And this one is the names Magno Vieira, Peter Murphy in the in in the paragraph. So I'm gonna read this one, mate. On this day in 2004, goals from Andy Priest, Magno Vieira, and Peter Murphy broke the conference duck for United as they recorded their first victory of the non-league season at the lawn against Forest Green Rovers. It was welcome relief for manager Paul Simpson, who was under no illusion as to just how difficult the season ahead was going to be. Um, right, I need, to, I need to make up a question on the spot now relating to that paragraph. So my question to you, Liam, is if Carl... <laughs> This is what happens when I don't prepare, man. This is what happens when I don't prepare. I do apologise to everybody. If Carlisle United went down... Well, here we go. Yeah, why not? This is a stupid question. If Carlisle United got relegated this season, would you still have Paul Simpson in charge next season? Oh. That is difficult. a good question. It's, it's never going to happen. Oh, I shouldn't have said that. <laughs> touch wood. Touch wood. Um, Someone. But... I'm not sure you know because... If he went down, he'd have a lot of dance for because he's made some sort of good big signings this summer. Um, you know what? He's took us down before and look what happened last time. So, yeah, stick with him for a bit. Oldham did it with John Sheridan, I suppose. And you can always get the fans to blame the board instead of the manager. I don't think Carlisle fans are ever going to turn on to Simo. No, yeah. I don't think so. I, I reckon Simo. I reckon Simo could take us down and still still be in the hot seat. Like uh, I reckon he really. Yeah, could. exactly. I'll be sitting in, in the like Northwest Counties League Division Two and I'll still have him in charge, you know, like keep him, yeah. Oh man, Liam, thank you so much for joining me for episode 81 of the Blue Army podcast. It's been an absolute pleasure and there's nothing else really left for the two of us to do apart from say bye for now. Bye. And uh, don't forget to follow Liam Denwood over on YouTube by typing in Blue Army TV. There'll be a link to his YouTube channel in the description of this episode. Thank you.